What is going on guys here at the JRP headquarters again coming at you with another video So we got really busy after the first video, you know uh, I was trying to shoot a bunch of other videos, but we just got so busy that we just kind of focused on the projects and Thank God now it's kind of like Slow down a little bit just enough so I can actually start making videos for you guys And you guys are gonna get to see all the you know other cool projects as you guys can see all the other cars that were here before our route we got a bunch of other cars that are outside for other projects, but you know, we're either waiting for like machine work, uh, machine shop parts to come back, or we're just waiting for parts to come back. Um, but uh, today, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing a 4B11 assembly, and you guys will get to see that. Um, Jeffrey's not here right now, uh, so I'm gonna just give you guys a rundown, and then I'm gonna put it on uh, time lapse video, and then when he gets here, the important stuff, you know, when I'm actually clearing some bearings or I'm actually stretching rod bolts and all that, I'll actually, you know, go over it so you guys actually get to understand what I'm trying to do. So, with that being said, let me show you guys what we got here. So, this is obviously 4B11 engine block with uh, LA sleeves, 87mm uh, bore, utilizing the stock head gasket. Um, yeah, I'm using CP pistons. I'll show you guys uh, that in a second. So this engine actually spun bearings um, But luckily Nothing got engraved in the journals and obviously I had my machine shop check it and lightly polish it But there's no burrs or any like high spots on any of these journals. So this is perfect perfect ready to go um, So I have it laid down here so I can actually start micing it with my handy dandy micrometers and actually take the journal measurements and write it down so I can reference it and figure out my bearing clearances as we're going. So we got some piston ring pliers over here. Um, and this is like six, seven dollars. And it's one of those tools that if you don't have this and you're building engines, I can't take you seriously. I mean, I've seen numerous people try to walk piston rings on and they just, the problem with doing that is a ring is a very, very vulnerable item i want to i want to call it and it's also very essential to your engine because the ring is literally what holds the compression inside the cylinder so if you do anything to basically lower the integrity of that part the ring does not do its job as efficiently anymore so something as easy as this you know as you can you know grab the ring and walk it on the piston and let it go and it's perfect uh you know versus actually like bending it and trying to walk it on the piston this is the best way to do it. I have never walked the piston ring onto a piston in my life and I never will. I just don't think it's professional and it's one less thing you have to worry about. And I mean, as you guys can see, we're kind of perfectionists over here. We like to do everything like very meticulously. So this is no different. Uh, we got some feeler gauges over here so we can measure ring end gaps. And then we got our electronic ring grinder here to modify those end gaps as necessary. Um, and we got a dowel because this block was missing a dowel when it came back from the machine shop, not a problem. We got Mitsubishi dowels in stock, always a Sharpie to mark things. These are actually diamond burrs. So uh, you will see this if you go to like the downtown LA, like jeweler, jeweler, jeweler's district, I'm sorry. Um, and basically what this is, this is a very fine file. So the reason we have this is because every time you grind the piston rings, these sharp edges have to be deburred or else you're gonna basically run into issues where the sharp edge will basically grab onto the ring land or grab onto the cylinder and start scuffing it and creating excessive drag and you know wearing out the ring and the cylinder and all that so every time i grind a ring and anytime it's perfectly filed to fit what I'll do is I'll take those diamond burrs and I'll go over it and I'm, I'll make sure there's no sharp edges whatsoever. And then after every single time that we uh, grind the piston rings, I will butt the ends, make sure they're perfectly flush. You know, you don't want to have, you want it to be as perfectly flush. I don't know if you can see, but that's pretty damn close. Um, and I will also look at it like this to make sure it's perfectly straight and it's not bent. If it's bent, I'll throw it away. I'll get another set. Um, King bearings, our go-to bearings. I mean, I have never ever had a set like disappoint me. I have, I, I think I've only had to use two sets in one build once, like, you know, in order to get the clearance I want. But with their um, bullseye laser tolerance um, yeah. deal, it's, it's very, very time efficient, you know, for us to assemble an engine because the clearances are usually dead on where I want it. 
uh, you know, I, you do have to sometimes swap it around. I'm not saying you don't, but you don't have to use multiple sets to achieve your desired clearance. Uh, this is our rod bolt stretch gauge. Basically, we don't just torque the rods anymore. The torque wrench is just kind of a tool, and then you use this to basically verify the torque. So the torque wrench isn't my final, you know, okay, I'm just going to torque it to this and leave it at that. That That's not very accurate anymore because there's a lot of things that cause the torque wrench to be off. Let's say you drop the torque wrench or you haven't had it calibrated for a year or whatever. Yeah, the numbers could be off. So the manufacturer will basically tell you that, hey, if you have a 1.5 inch long bolt, that's three eighths in diameter, you need to be at per se like five and three ten thousandths to six thousandths of um, stretch, let's say. I'm just throwing out numbers. Um, so what we do is we'll torque it to the lowest value on the spec and then we'll check the uh, stretch and then we'll go from there if it's not the proper stretch obviously we back it off we put new lubricant on it we go like one or two feet above that value and we check the stretch again and you go on until you reach your desired stretch um if you if you torque it and if you torque it to like the last recommended uh, torque value and you still can't stretch it enough there's something going on either there's like foreign material on the fastener threads or uh, on the actual threads of the connecting rod itself are you using too little lubricant and it's creating too much drag and too much uh, friction and it just it doesn't it basically doesn't get stretched properly so you guys will get to see all that uh it's it's one of those things that like the more you do it the more you understand it and the easier it becomes to like grasp onto and figure out how to make it work um Obviously, we have some ARP main studs. We love using these if, if the block is getting align honed or at least the alignment of the main board is checked. It's very important because the ARP main studs will actually uh, clamp down the uh, main caps uh, st like stronger with more force. And uh, when you do that, sometimes the main board can actually distort and oval a little bit. So you definitely want to have your machine shop check it if you're using these because if that's the case, they might have to align on it. Not a big deal, but it's something you do absolutely have to check. Um, these are just regular ARP uh, head studs. I always use the 625s for, for the builds, but the customer already had this um, kind of on a budget. So we're just using this right now. And if, uh, you know, I don't like using them. If I know in the future, I'm gonna be using another stud because what happens is the block actually gets torque plated with the provided head stud. So if now, let's say we put 625s, it has a different clamping force, the cylinder can be a little bit out of round or whatnot. Um, but for now, he will be good. You know, he's not trying to make crazy amounts of power, although everything else is pretty much set up for that. Um, shelf CP pistons. I love these sheep, uh, sheep, the CP pistons because um, they have a nice like pin boss area. As you can see, it's pretty thick. And then the actual dome area, I mean, you, this is something you get it by fill, but it's pretty thick. So they're very nice hard pistons. Um, from my experience, the CPs do take a little longer to warm up. So it's some, if, if, you're, if the motor's very loose, which we don't build loose motors anymore, um, but if it is, it takes a little longer to warm up than like, let's say a Manly or a white cycle pistons. It's just, it's just a compound that they use. But uh, I, like I said, it could, that problem could have gone away because I, we haven't built a loose motor ever since, I don't know, ever since I started building motors. I mean, I believe in good machine work and not trying to substitute good machine work with, you know, extra clearances to, you know, basically band-aid something that you could have fixed in the first place, aka a torque plate. These pins are 250 thou pins. This is a upgraded metal that CP offers and it's obviously 250 thou. The downside of this is it beats up the bearings a little more, but you'll never yank a pin out. These are very strong wrist pins. Uh, NPR ring packs uh, supplied by CP, very great ring packs. This is what I had in my 1000 horsepower Revo 8 as well. Holds great compression, never had issues with the rings, uh, you know, the, very, very good rings to, to say the least. Um, uh, turbo tough i beams with the uh, ARP 2000 bolts. Um, the rods obviously got the big ends got re rebored and the the board checked basically because he spawned bearings. Um, but everything's good to go. 
um, everything's already, these are already honed and ready to go. Micrometers for various tasks, for instance, this three to four micros for pistons. So this, this is going to allow me to measure my pistons. Um, and then basically use my dial bore gauge over there to see what my piston to wall clearance is. Um, and then these mics are pretty much, you know, for everything else. Like this is going to be for 4B11s, main and rod journals. If it's a 4G63 for the rod journals, I'm going to need to use this because the rod journals are smaller than the mains. The 4B11 is almost the same exact size. Um, yeah, so you guys will get to see that. As you guys can see, we use a bunch of King bearings. Uh, mouth fanboying. I just love the fucking product. Um, we got a dial indicator to measure crankshaft runout to make sure the crankshaft is straight and also to me measure crankshaft end plate to make sure it has enough thrust clearance and you know it's not gonna basically eat up the thrust bearings as soon as it starts we got the arp uh the ultra torque fastener lubricant which is basically their molly lube and this is for the head studs and only head studs um, as far as the rod bolts go, I either use the manly stuff that I have over there. Shout out to Arlington Machine, he supplied me with that. Um, or I use the CP stuff, the CP stuff I, I love as well. And then over here, we just got a piston, uh, the pistol oil squirter. Which is, you know, if you want to just, you know, lube up the. So at this point we have the bearings in there, the bearing shells in there, the main caps in there and torque down, torque to spec. So you basically have to do this and um, get your dial bore gauge zeroed out to your mic, which is going to be the size of the main journal, or if you're measuring the rods, it's going to be the rod journal. So basically this is zeroed out to that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm basically just going to check every single bearing, if you want to come over here and show. <clears throat> So anytime this dial bore gauge is straight and it stops, that's the clearance from zero. So what I'm trying to say is, two point four thou, two point three thou. So that's see, it's a little tighter when it goes inside. So that's about two point one thou of clearance. So we've already gone ahead and done this and I've blueprinted the whole uh, main, so it's, it's all good to go. So it's actually time to drop in the crank, but I just wanted to show you guys how we actually measure the clearance and how we determine if it's good or not. If, you know, sometimes you'll end up with like 2.8 down and the rest will be at 2.2 down. You really wanna get another bearing shell and try to get the clearance as close as the rest of them as possible. Cause you don't want basically oscillating oil pressure between main to main. Um, and there's a wide range that you can be at, uh, but you know we try to stick with what's worked for us in the past, which is pretty much 2.2 to 2.4, even 2.5 down for the mains, and uh, similar for the rods, maybe a little looser for the rods because uh, the engine, the oiling system in the engine, the basically the oil path is just like a hydraulic path that takes the path of least resistance, and usually. The rod bearings are the ones that starve of oil. So if there is a little bit more clearance, uh, what happens is the oil will actually take the path of least resistance and actually go to the rod bearings. So it's kind of like you're kind of forcing the oil to more so go towards the rod bearings. More. But obviously, you know these are very tight clearances still for you know a small engine like this with a good oiling system. You know the 4B11 and the 4G63s have a very good oiling system. They build a lot of oil pressure. So um, yeah. That's what we're doing. So we're gonna put the squirters in there. We're gonna go clean the bearings one more time. Assembly lube, put the thrust bearings in there. Um, put the crankshaft in there, torque it down, make sure you know thrust thrust end plate is where it needs to be. And then we can proceed to you know gapping piston rings, measuring piston to wall clearance, and basically dropping in the con rods in. Yeah. You ready to party? Sir. All right, so. We got the main bearings clearance, we got the crankshaft in there, we got the main studs torqued down, the spec, there's some move on the bearings obviously. We ended up at 2.2 uh, .2 to 2.3 thou of clearance for every single main. Uh, usually what I try to do is uh, just make sure, obviously none of them are too tight, but uh, most importantly I don't want the last one to be tight because it has a lot of... You know, there's a lot of rotational mass in the back of the engine, you know, with the flywheel, there's the transmission, the input shaft and all that stuff. So. 
you know, if I have to swap around bearings, my preference is to have it a, a tiny bit. When I'm saying a tiny bit, I'm talking about like a tenth of a thou looser on the uh, back end of the crankshaft, so the fifth, uh, fifth main. But for the most part, we just make sure they're pretty even all across, and that's really what you want to shoot for. And as I was saying, uh, when I was showing you guys what I was doing before when Jeffrey was filming, we try to shoot a little looser for the rods just so it takes the path of least resistance which is obviously the main gets fed first and then it goes to the rod journal so just just a, another tenth of a thou or two tenths of a thou but as you guys can see the crank is spinning perfectly so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to check the thrust clearance or crankshaft end play and make sure the thrust springs you know aren't too thick or you know too loose uh, it, it feels great i mean i can by now, I can just tell you by feel that it's going to be okay, but you really don't want it to be too tight because, you know, uh, metal does expand, obviously, hence why we need clearances. And uh, if it's too tight, let's say it's at two or three thousandths of an inch, uh, I'm going to have to modify the thrust bearings or use another set. And uh, I say modify because I've done it before. It's just a piece of metal. If you shave the back perfectly flat, you're not going to have any issues to gain your clearance you need. Uh, but yeah, that's where we are right now. Up next is going to be the crankshaft end play. And then we're going to basically spec out our rod bearings and make sure that they have proper oil clearance. Um, and then we're going to assemble everything and we're going to get the piston rings and assemble the bottom end today. All right, so we just got done modifying the connecting rods. And when I say modifying, I mean for the side clearance on the main journal. So on the, I'm sorry, on the crankshaft journal. So basically you don't want this to be too tight. The relationship between the connecting rod itself and uh, the actual crank. So what happens is if this is too tight, let's say this is at like three or four thousands, you can actually run into issues where you can actually spin a bearing due to like the oil pressure not being able to like relief itself. Uh, you know through the side through the clearance over here and if it's too loose like let's say it's at like 15 or 20 thousandths what you can do is that you can actually lose oil pressure so what we do is we check and we make sure you know it's within our spec which is anywhere from you know six for normal applications to all the way up to 10 12 thou is okay on these motors uh but i try to stay at like eight to ten thou uh, this is right at eight thou and we basically modified all the other ones to be at eight thou as well so uh, yeah, now we can actually clearance the bearings and uh, assemble the rest of the bottom end together. All right, guys. So the connecting rod bearings are already specced out. We ended up at uh, 2.3 thou of oil clearance for all four, which is perfectly where I wanted it. Um, so up next, what we're going to do is we're actually going to gauge this, these uh, CP pistons. And every, every piston manufacturer has, is going to have a different gauge point. The CP is right about here. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how many thousands of an inch it was, but I have the spec sheet somewhere. I'm going to go look at it real quick. Uh, basically, we're going to gauge it, and then we're going to use our dial bore gauge, uh, yeah, dial bore gauge again, and basically measure piston to wall clearance. Now, one thing to note: this motor has been torque plated. It got torque plated with the head gasket that it was going to be used, with the head studs it was going to be used. Same process as we religiously follow for every single engine build. I do not have a 4B11 torque plate here. Now that that arises a problem when you're trying to measure piston to wall clearance because, you know, as I mentioned before, the walls get distorted without the head being on there or a torque plate being on there. So the best way to do this is to go about 40 to 50 percent in the cylinder, and that's where it's le the least distorted when there's no torque plate bolted on. Um, I, I trust my machinist. I have a very good relationship with him. I know exactly what's been done to this block and every other block, in fact, that's. Uh, comes out of the machine shops that I use. So uh, I know for a fact it's torque plated. I know for a fact the uh, roundness and the trueness of the cylinder is not going to be an issue. So uh, I just double check it for my own sake. And you know, I'm blueprinting the motor, so I have to have that in my notes. Um, also, the pistons and rods are also balanced whenever you get an engine built by us. And I suggest anybody that's doing this, even if you're a DIYer, you know, because this isn't just for my business if you're trying to do this you know i'll be glad to help you out if you can take something away from this video or if you i don't cover something and you need to basically figure it out just drop a comment and i'll be more than happy to help you guys out anyway back to my point um pistons and rods usually i, I want to say about 80 percent of the 
these performance shops, they won't even balance these on a four cylinder. What they will do is they'll balance the crank, which you have to balance by itself because it's not a V8, you know, the bob, you don't have to put bob weights on it when you're trying to balance it. Um, they'll balance the crank and they'll call it a day. We go a step further, we balance every piston and every rod to the lightest one, which I'm, uh, which what I'm trying to say by that is, let's say this piston weighs, for instance, 450 grams. All the other ones are like 451 or like 450.5. They will all get basically like material taken off to match the lightest one. Okay, and there, there, there's different ways to do it, but usually the most common way to do it is the insides over here or like even over here underneath this part of the, of the, of the actual dome of the piston. Um, same follows for the pins. The pins can usually, whenever the pins are getting modified, basically material will be taken out from here. You know, it's, 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 it's all the same. Like these can all get balanced by themselves to the lightest one. And as long as they're balanced, let's say each rod is for, uh, 550 grams, right? It really doesn't matter what piston you use with what rod. Again, as long as they're balanced like that. And we try to go as, as, as low as, you know, two tenths of a, uh, of a gram, but usually five tenths of a gram is more than enough because like I said, m most shops, uh, and I'm not trying to bash on shops. This is just a fact of the matter. Most shops won't even do this and they'll have, you know, variances of two, three grams within the rotating assembly. And that's really not good for the bearings and longevity of the motor and just, op you know, efficiency of the motor uh, overall. As you guys can see, these rods have been balanced. As you guys can see, the material has been taken off over here. And another thing we always do is we mark these rod caps, so the actual rod to the cap. The last thing you want to do is get excited and take all these off and then, you know, mix one of these up. You're going to have a very bad day when you start the engine. Well, actually, the engine probably won't turn even with, you know, by hand. Uh, so, yeah, that's that. And then we also went ahead and we gapped the rings, so the piston rings are gapped. So for this particular application, or this is a, our Savage package, we rated for 800 horsepower. Usually 17 thou for the top ring and about 18 thou for the second compression ring is more than enough. Uh, it is kind of an app, you know, per application basis. Uh, I've gapped them a lot looser and I've gapped them a lot tighter before. Uh, this is kind of the sweet spot for the 4 v 11 4G63 is a tiny bit different, but uh, again, it just varies on what you're trying to do. For instance, I'm building a nitrous motor next. Um, we've accounted that uh, for that by honing the block another half a thou. So instead of three and a half, it's at four thou. And then the rings actually get um, gapped a little looser just because of the you know secondary power adder. Um, and uh, the whole theory behind that is you know you don't want these the piston to expand and the rings to basically get pushed enough that these ends actually but when that happens you know you'll break ring lands you'll destroy cylinders you'll do all kinds of crazy stuff that you you, know, you can easily avoid if you just do your homework or have someone build it that's done this a thousand times um so up next is going to be cleaning the ring packs and when i say cleaning i mean with atf uh atf is a detergent uh, in fact, every engine that comes back from the machine shop, um, I'll pressure wash, I'll clean the cylinders with ATF, a lot of gunk will come out. This is after hot hanging at the machine shop. I'll pressure wash it again, I'll, I'll ATF it again, this is two times, and then I'll pressure wash it a third time, I'll dry everything, and then I'll, I'll proceed with assembly. Um, ATF, I swear by it religiously when it comes to engine building. Um, the ring packs are pretty dirty from the manufacturer like there's a lot of uh, I don't know what to call it but like it's this residue they put on there so the rings don't actually rust uh, ATF cleans that out perfectly um, as you guys will get to see probably in the time lapse because Jeffrey's not here so I'm just gonna put this on time lapse and go on with this because I have to finish this bottom end today um, so we clean it with ATF um, and then you another thing is you got to make sure the ATF is off because ATF is very slippery and once you start the motor, you don't want it to be super slippery. That's why we don't use synthetic oil. The whole theory behind that is that you don't want the rings to basically start slipping and not have uh, a bite on the cylinder wall. Because even though this is a plateau honed motor, meaning it doesn't have any peaks and ridges and you don't really need to do a break in 
period, you want the rings to be as dry as possible so they can actually grab on and knock off all those you know, remaining like peaks and ridges that uh, exist. So, um, yeah, this is just another day in the office, I guess. I mean, I talk about it and I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of information, but it really it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's, you just got to take your time with stuff like this. Like whenever, you know, I start like getting irritated at something, I'll put it down and I'll walk away. I've learned, I have learned that you have to do that in order to not break stuff. Um, but yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, another thing about the ring gaps or clearances in general, if I were building a straight E85 motor or straight ethanol, methanol motor, um, it doesn't have to be as loose in clearances. Not that these motors are loose, but what I'm trying to say is E85 actually pulls heat from the cylinder. So when you have the combustion chamber happen with pump gas, it's not as, it does, it basically the, basically E85 burns cooler. I'm sure you guys have heard this. And, it, it, and it's an actual truth because it's alcohol. So it basically pulls the heat out of whatever it touches, you know, be it the cylinder wall, be it the piston, uh, be it the piston rings. So you can get away with less ring gap if you're running strictly on ethanol because the parts don't ex expand as much. Um, and these are things that you learn throughout the years. What works with what, if it's an E85 motor only, what kind of gaps do you run? If it's a pump gas motor only, what kind of, you know, what kind of gaps do you run? If it's a pump gas nitrous motor, if it's an E85 nitrous motor, all that stuff comes into play. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'm going to time lapse the rest of this. I'm going to assemble the pistons, ring packs, put the rods on the designated pistons, and then just drop them in and stretch the rod bolts. And then I'll talk about stretching rod bolts when I, uh, when I get to that. All right, excuse the mess. This is usually the outcome after you finish putting the pistons and conrads together because of all the assembly lube and the molly lube and all that. Anyway, so all these pistons and ring sets are assembled, ready to go. And you kind of want those rings, you know, flopping around like that because that ensures that there's, you know, there, there's no like high spot or anything that they can catch on to. I'm very particular with stuff like that. You know, that's gonna, again, directly correlate compression, being able to seal in the cylinder and all that stuff. So rings are very important. We pay special attention to all that stuff. Uh, that's that. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our handy dandy little bore spec um, Wiseco piston ring compressor. And we're, firstly, we're gonna clean the cylinder walls very good with brake cleaner and a bunch of air and stuff to make sure all the lint and everything's off. We're gonna clean the rod journal, make sure there's nothing on there. And then we're gonna put some non-synthetic, very important non-synthetic. I use brad pen, but you can use any conventional oil uh, on the cylinder walls. And then some oil with the oil squirter on the rings, uh, the piston skirt, and then it's gonna go inside. Uh, obviously assembly loop for the bearings. And then you guys will get to see me stretch the rod bolts, but that's pretty much it. After we do that, that's the last step basically, dropping it in, stretch the rod bolts, check the right uh, rod side clearance to the crank, uh, crank journal, and that's pretty much it. You have yourself a bottom man. What's up guys? And we're back here with Ronnie still building the motor. So we're, um, I wanna say final steps. So as you guys saw previously, we cleaned the cylinders, we basically gapped the rings, we clearance the bearings and now what we're doing is we're actually just putting the piston conrad combo in and then we're stretching the rod bolts so I'm gonna do one I'm, I keep doing the time lapse but I'm gonna do one so you guys can see live how, how it kind of works so again this is the ring compressor we have ring compressors by size we have every size that we use well currently use and we ordered it as needed so I did number one and I'm gonna do number four because the journal is already down so Put the ring compressor there, ring orientation. You kind of follow the manufacturer's recommendation. These are CP pistons. They don't have the dot to basically tell you which side is the front of the motor, but it's pretty simple really. There's, there's uh, big valve release or the, for the intake valves, for the intake valves. So 
at the 4B11, when it sits like this, the intake manifold is facing towards the front of the car. So knowing that, the bigger valve reliefs are gonna be towards me because this is the this is gonna be the front of the motor. So ring orientation for these is pretty straightforward. Top compression ring um, goes up towards the exhaust, bottom compression ring towards the intake manifold. Oil control rings are pretty much generic, but um, the end gap should be here and they should have it should be butted and it shouldn't be overlapped. It's kind of hard to mess it up because it's over if it's overlapped you can't put the uh, control rings on there and then the other control rings one end goes here one end goes here pretty straightforward like i said every manufacturer is going to have the spec like included with the pistons so one last thing i do is obviously we make sure there's nothing underneath the bearing obviously we double check it quadruple check it like 70 times uh, get some assembly glue we like using the red line stuff because it's not super slick uh, but at the same time it's it does the job like a slick assembly lube would um, I've used this stuff since I started building engines, so I kind of stuck to it. So that's that. You don't need an extreme amount. I actually don't like it when it starts dripping next to the bearings because there's no crush from the other side of, uh, of, of the cap. So every time I get a little drop, I'll take the bearing out, clean it, and I'll put it back in again. It's just a superstition, but I've never lost the motor to a rod bearing failure, and I'm trying to keep it that way, so I'm not going to take chances. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some 30-weight uh, oil, uh, really any oil that's not synthetic because when, you, you know when the rings are in operation at first you want them to seat so non non synthetic brad pen oil that we use so I just put some on the rings here just to kind of hold them in place you know we look at our wrist pins again everything's the way it needs to be yes sir and then one last thing that we do is we kind of squirt some on the cylinder walls as well and then one last thing I like to do is go from under and make sure besides the oil there's no contaminants or foreign material on the um, rod journal of the crank. And that's it. So now we can put our compressor on here. Grab our assembly. Slowly guide it in. Make sure we don't pinch any of the rings. Make sure you don't get your glove caught like I did. Kind of feed the rings in there slowly. Okay, now at this point, when you feel a little bit of resistance, that's normal. What I do is I grab a plastic amaranth and, and it goes. So if you were to do this with a regular ring plier, you would be cussing a lot. So now what we do is, I actually kind of like to guide it onto the journal itself and then turn it around. Now once it's turned around, as you can see, everything's clean, there's some oil on there, but that's perfectly fine. So we take the correct rod cap, blow it off once more, make sure there's no foreign contaminants on there, put some more assembly lube on here. with our high pressure lube so at this point what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna snug these for now once it gets to that point because the rod is doweled I want to make sure it pulls evenly so what I'll do is I'll, I'll take my little ratchet just like walk them in and as you guys can see, now it's seated. So now what I'll do is I'll actually back off one, or both of them rather, and then I will take my rod bolt stretch gauge, and I will put it on the indent on top of the rod bolts and the receiver groove on the bottom of the rod bolt. So as you can see, it's, it's secured in there. So now I will zero out the fastener. So when I, I'm sorry, I'll zero out my gauge to my fastener. So every fastener is gonna have a different length. Uh, don't freak out over this. Uh, what you should do if you really want to be anal about this is measure each fastener before assembly and let's say after 20,000 miles or whatever you want to service it you take the rods apart measure the fastener again make sure it hasn't stretched um, but from the factory it's gonna it's gonna be different like if I zero out, out to this fastener and if I 
put this gauge on here right now, it's gonna be completely different. So as you guys can see right now, it's, it's zeroed out to this certain fastener. So the manufacturer gives you a torque spec and a stretch stuff. Some people will just go to the torque spec, they go to the maximum value and they call it a day. We don't do that. We actually go the, uh, you know, the step further and we make sure the fastener is properly stretched. We have the tool, so we use it accordingly. So on this setup, I, I found out that 60 to 62 foot pounds seems to be the sweet spot. They say 55 to 65, so 62 is the sweet spot and it ends up right at six to 6.2 tenths of a thou stretch. So let's see if we can achieve that on the first pass. So snug it up. And I don't do no, you know, half torque bullshit. Snug it up and one full pull. There you go. Our zero gauge. So as you guys can see, it's at about five. So I need to take this off. I need to apply some more lubricant on there and try it again. And then if at the same torque level, I don't acquire the stretch, I'm going to go up with the torque level. It's pretty straightforward. So we'll be right back. And we're back again. Yeah, sorry, something happened with the camera. Uh, anyway, so now we have the proper stretch. As you guys can see, it's right over 6 now. It's actually about 6.2. So that's where exactly where I want it to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it off, back off both bolts, zero the fastener out of this one. Or the, I'm sorry, the gauge out of this one. And then do the same thing with this and if they both end up being in the you know spe specified spec that we need it to be we'll torque them down we'll just mark it with our pen so we know you know we've torqued it and then we'll move on to the other other pistons and rods so zero it out That's right at six down. It's exactly where we want it to be. So again, 62 foot pounds from both. Alright, so we just wrapped up the 4B11 build. As you guys can see, pistons are in. All the connecting wild bolts are obviously stretched. Everything's good to go. Rotate it over a few times. Rotates very, very nicely. That's about it. And next is the head. It's unfortunate that we can't look at the pistons anymore because the head's gonna go on, but it is what it is. That's it. That's how you build a 4B11 in a day. Peace.